So again, good morning and welcome. It's been a good Sunday so far, amen? amen? It's a joy, it's an honor, it's a privilege to be able to be here and to serve amongst such an amazing church family, but to also celebrate new members welcoming uh, into the church through the act of uh, the sacrament of baptism, um, through singing songs of praise. Uh, I don't know that I've ever paid enough attention to know the words. Uh, as a kid, I don't know about you, but sometimes you make the words up as you go. You sing them so often, you just kind of assume certain words. I didn't realize like that the, the name of the song was one thing, and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I know this song. Like, uh, Noel, Noel, Noel. But I'm excited to be here this morning. Now, I want to start this morning with a question. Everybody ready? Take a deep breath. Here we go. Here we go. Who is not at all anxious, nervous, freaking out about Christmas that's just like a week and a half away? Anybody like really chill and just kind of doing well? So that's way more than I anticipated because I don't don't know about you. Like I am like I am on stress level 12. We uh, we decided yesterday to make um, a bad decision. We did a bad decision yesterday. We went to the mall. Uh, I took my two daughters to the Florida mall yesterday to buy a Christmas present for my wife, to which she's probably thinking, I don't know that there's anything at all at the mall that I like, but it was really more for the girls to kind of get out of the house and, and everything, because right now my house, I don't know if you know this, is filled with a lot of stress. Filled with a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of um, screaming and, and whining, mostly coming out of this little one-year-old dog that we adopted recently. <laughs> Man, I look at that thing and I just get filled up with anxiety. I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And, and we've been trying to train this dog. So uh, at the beginning of the week, my wife had a great idea, but you know, in the midst of a crazy Christmas season, adding more to a pastor, never really a good idea. But she, had a, she actually had a really good idea and I, I just kind of struggled with it. Um, it was, let's walk a mile every morning and two miles every evening to try to calm the dog down so that it actually sleeps through the night. Because since we've gotten the dog, I don't remember sleep, um, except for like one night. And I think we put the dog in the, uh, Ella's bedroom, who's my oldest. But we've gotten this dog into, into our life in the midst of this Christmas season. And my anxiety level has risen exponentially each and every moment and every minute of every day. So Christmas right now is supposed to be a time of of great joy, overwhelming happiness. It's It's supposed to be filled with stress. It's supposed to be filled with love and hope and compassion. And yet what I find in the middle of one of the most joyous times of the year is a whole lot of stress and anxiety weighing upon my life. But my follow-up question is this. How do we find joy in the midst of the crazy? How do we find joy in the midst of all of the things that are going on in our lives? How do we find joy? You know, I, I was brought back to a moment of clarity in the midst of the dog situation. I know that my anxiety has been high, and and I have no intentions of getting rid of this dog, but I've definitely been like, dog, if you don't calm down, you might live on the back porch. Maybe in the backyard. She's kind of scrawny. She'd probably slip through the fence, and it would be a bad day. Although part of me is like, eh, I'd get to sleep again. But... I was reminded of how much this dog means to my children when my my daughter came home the other day and she had a writing assignment in her class and she wrote these two beautiful, eloquent poems and she's like, Daddy, do you want to hear my poems? And I'm like, yes. And then she said them and all of a sudden I could just feel the knife protruding out of my back, right? As much as I have been stressed out and anxious and nervous and struggling to find joy, these... This, this dog has brought so much joy to my daughters. You see, church family, even in the midst of a busy Christmas season, even in the midst of having to clean up the house because we know family is coming, 
we can still find joy. Even in the midst of pain and loss and sorrow and suffering and hurt, we can still possess joy. Even in the midst of disappointment and grief and anxiety and depression, we can still hold fast to joy. So this morning, as we are in our Home for Christmas series, we turn our attention back to joy. We turn our attention back to joy. So let's begin with a basic definition. What is joy? Well, according to dictionary.com, joy is the emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. It's a keen pleasure. It's elation. It's the expression or display of glad feelings. So according to the dictionary, hear me, according to the dictionary, joy is very much tied up with feelings. And that's why for some of us, we can wake up in the morning and we could have a great morning. We got, you know, eight hours of solid sleep. There was no dog pouncing on you, licking you in the face like human, human. Walk me. Like, we could have a great morning, and things could be feeling very good, but then you step out of the bed, and if you're anything like me, if it's not fully light out, and the nightlight is not working, maybe you stub your toe on the way to the bathroom, and all of a sudden that emotion has gone from great joy to pain, and you're like, ah! How can I experience joy in this moment when everything in me hurts? When everything in me is, is going wrong? Well, you see, the problem is, is I don't think joy in this sense is fully tied into emotion. I think there's another word for that. I think that word is happiness. Happiness is a great thing. But I think happiness is a byproduct of joy. I think C.S. Lewis has a better definition of what joy, especially as those who call themselves Christian, of what joy actually looks like. So I want to share this quote from Lewis. If you're around me long enough, you'll hear me quote C.S. Lewis probably more than anybody else. He's one of my favorite authors. But in his book, Surprised by Joy, he says this. Joy is an unsatisfied desire which itself is more desirable than any other satisfaction. Joy is, oh, it's not an unsatisfied, sorry, I read that wrong. Joy is not an unsatisfiable, unsatisfied desire which itself is more desirable than any other satisfaction. Joy is, however, similar to but distinct from happiness and pleasure. Joy has indeed one characteristic and only one in common with happiness and pleasure. It's the fact that anyone who has experienced it will want it again. Apart from that, and considered only in its quality, it might almost equally well be called a particular kind of unhappiness or grief. But then it is a kind of unhappiness or grief, this joy that we actually want. I doubt whether anyone who has ever tasted it would ever, if both of these other options were given to them in their power, exchange it for all of the pleasures of the world. But then joy is never in our power, and pleasure is. So let me summarize this quote, because the well, first time I read it, I had to read it again and again and again and again, because the more I read it, the more it actually didn't make sense until I kind of took it apart and unpacked it. Here's what Lewis is saying. He says, joy is so much more than a feeling of happiness or pleasure. We, we understand that. That you can have joy, joy, joy down in your heart, even when life is not filled with happiness or pleasure. Because happiness is fleeting and pleasure is fleeting. But joy comes with the morning and it remains. Because Lewis's point, as we begin to unpack it, is that joy is something that comes from outside of us. Joy is something that comes from outside of us, i.e. joy is rooted in God. 
And once we experience real joy, once we experience God, it's something we wouldn't trade for anything else in the world. A few months back, we did a series through the fruit of the Spirit. And we said that the fruit of God's Spirit, the evidence that God is within us, dwelling within our hearts, is if we have these different characteristics. It was love, and then what was the second one? Joy. And we said that joy is an internal characteristic that is given to us from God. So for any of us this morning who are struggling with joy, maybe the issue is that we're more focused or fixated on happiness than we are on joy, because joy comes from Jesus. Amen? So I, I think there's a place that we see this even in the midst of the Christmas story. So this morning, as we continue in our Christmas text, we turn our attention towards answering the question, how do we find joy, real joy, in the midst of everything that's going on? Well, joy is found if we're in the right place. So let's jump into our text. We're in chapter 1, verses 39 through 56, but we're going to break it up, and we're going to start with verses 39 through 45. So let me, let me set the context just a little bit. In the Gospel of Luke, remember, we've talked about this now for a few weeks. Luke was a doctor by trade. He was a physician. He was a man of science who goes to investigate the things that, that he's heard about because it was second and third hand accounts that he had heard about. So he goes to investigate what happened around the time of the birth of Jesus. And he goes and he asks firsthand accounts. He goes to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, tell me what happened on these days. And he goes to other disciples and he goes to other people and he gets this account of what happens. So straight from Mary, it's believed she tells Luke this story. So here in verses 39, she tells of her going to visit her cousin Mary or Elizabeth. In those days, Mary arose, went with haste into the hill country to a town in Ju Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby within Elizabeth leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with to cry, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And we're going to pause right there. So shortly after the angel Gabriel comes to visit Mary, Mary does four things. She arose, which means that she literally got up from what she was doing. She didn't dilly-dally. She didn't pause. She didn't like take her time. She got up and she moved with haste. It was undignified for someone to run in this culture. There was not really running for fun. And it was especially an undignified thing for a man to do because they would have wore a robe, they would have had sandals, and they would have been out running, and it just it would have been odd. So for her to get up from what she was doing and literally make haste and run to her cousin Elizabeth was kind of a big deal and something we should take notice of. And when she gets to Zachariah's house, she kind of like opens the door. I don't even imagine her knocking. She's kind of like, hey, I'm here. Mary, where you at? Or Elizabeth, where you at? It's Mary. And as soon as her cousin Elizabeth hears Mary's greeting, the child within Elizabeth leaped for joy. We're reminded that that child would grow up to be John the baptizer, Jesus' cousin, the one who baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. The one who said, I am not even worthy to tie your sandals. Why should I be the one who baptized you? And yet, Jesus reminds John that he's the one who's to prepare the way for him. So when Elizabeth hears the voice of Mary, 
The baby within her leaped for joy. One theologian said that this can be seen as a prophetic, a prophetic first instance of John preparing the way for Jesus. I thought that was so beautiful. That even within the womb, John was getting ready like, here he is! He's come to save the day. It's going to be awesome. And at that moment, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. And Elizabeth does two things. The first thing Elizabeth does is she prays. She prays to God and says, Blessed are you, Mary, among all of these women. Blessed are you. And not only are you blessed, but blessed are you, Jesus, the fruit of Mary's womb. So the first thing Elizabeth does is she prays. The second thing she does is she laments. She says, why? Why has this been granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of Mary's greeting has fallen upon my ears, the baby within me leapt for joy. And behold, blessed is she, Mary, who believed in all the things that Gabriel said to her, that they would one day be fulfilled just as the Lord had spoken them. So Elizabeth does these two things. She prays over Mary and then she laments. And as we continue, we see Mary's response. So in verse 46, we pick it up. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For He has looked upon the humble estate of His servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call Me blessed. For He who is mighty has done great things for Me, and holy is His name. And His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and He has exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich He has sent them away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy as He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring. And Mary remained with her cousin about three months and then returned to her home. And may God bless the reading of His Word. So we see two things taking place. We see that uh, Mary has left her home and she has traveled to her cousin Elizabeth, went into the home, greeted Elizabeth, the child within Elizabeth has leapt for joy. And in that moment, Elizabeth prays over Mary and laments over Mary. And Mary responds in what is traditionally called the, the Magnificat, which means to exalt and to praise. Some theologians call it Mary's hymn of praise or the praise of greatness or whatever you call it, you find Mary's response as a humbled servant to the state in which she finds herself. So in response to Elizabeth's prayer and lament, Mary appreciates all that God has done for her. There's a beautiful balance in Mary's praise of greatness this Magnificat. Mary expresses humble appreciation for the greatness of God, the holy nature of God, the mercy and grace of God. Mary looks upon her voluntary state of servanthood as an act of worship. And Mary is keenly aware that God's unique calling on her life would result in all future generations calling her blessed. It's an interesting prayer of praise that Mary has to say that all future generations will look upon her estate and call her blessed. 
She was a young, unwed teenage girl who was now impregnated by the Spirit of God and was going to have a child. In that day and age, it must have been crazy to think about what future generations would have thought when the current generation around her would have looked at her as if she was a pariah. They would have looked at her and said things like, you know what, you're a liar. There's no way your estate could actually be in the way that it is. There's no way God would descend from heaven and do what he has done. This is just crazy talk. They would have looked at her as an adulteress. That she would have cheated on her fiancé, Joseph. In her day and age, she would have been labeled with the scarlet letter. And we cannot miss this from the story because... When we hear Mary saying, future generations will call me blessed, what she's saying is that she's not only concerned about the then and there, but she was concerned for what was up ahead. We can learn a little bit from Mary of not only being so concerned of what's happening right now, but what's going to be happening up ahead. So Mary is appreciating God for all that's happened. She's saying, I am your humbled servant. This, this way I find myself, I know that this is the right thing, and I, I appreciate all that you are doing for me. And Mary moves in her hymn of praise from appreciating God to celebrating what her son's birth would mean for those future believers. Mary exalts God for His mercy which he will show for all generations, from generation to generation, all those who fear the Lord. And she says, listen, here's what previous generations saw. They saw God in power scatter the proud. They saw God in power topple the mighty. They saw God in power exalt the lowly. They saw God in power satisfy the hungry. They saw God in power turn away the rich. And they saw God in power abide in His love for His beloved Israel consistently. For you and I of this current and upcoming generation, Mary says that God will continue to remember His mercies. He will impute His grace and He will offer forgiveness for all those who call upon the name of the Lord. Thus they will find salvation. So we find in the midst of this story a, a kind of formula for prayer. And it's one that I want to share with us this morning. That when you and I are looking at how we can have joy in our lives, well, we need to take a cue from Elizabeth and Mary. You see, we need to be in the right place. The first thing is that we prayed. Prayer does not need to be completely intimidating. We see that Elizabeth's prayer was basically saying, blessed are you, Mary. Prayer for us is a dialogue between us and God. There's no right words. We don't need high, exalted praise of, Thou Father who art in heaven, you are mightieth, mightiest. And use words that we don't actually speak in. Prayer is more like the child who crawls up to their father's knee, looks up at them, puts their hands up, and the father comes along and scoops the child up and places them on the knee, and the kid looks at the father, and the father looks at the kid, and the kid just goes, blah, 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 blah. And the father who was there the whole day watching, seeing, knowing, is filled with great joy that we would come before Him and share those same thoughts and hopes and wishes and prayers with God. For many of us today, when it comes to prayer, we need to do two things. We need to push through acts. We need to push. Pray until something happens. We need to pray until something happens. And one way we can do that is through acts. Through prayers of adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. We need to pray in a way that we come to the Father and have a conversation with Him. He's waiting for many of us because for some of us, and I don't want to call any of us out, we haven't talked to our Father in a long time. 
the one in heaven who sees us every day, who loves us unconditionally, who is well pleased with us. If we want to start to find joy, a joy that's found in Jesus, we need to start talking to God. The second thing is to lament. Elizabeth lamented by asking the question of why has this been granted to me? A lament is a question or a cry out to God. There is no question that you might have, no cry that you might have, no pain that you have suffered that you cannot offer up to God. If God was too small for your cries, then He is no God at all. But for some of us, in order to find joy, we need to lament. We need to sit in sorrow because Jesus tells us, blessed are those who mourn. We need to cry out to God with our issues of grievous injustice, both personal and universal. We need to lament because sometimes to find joy, we have to dig down deep through the muck. Mary then shows us that to find joy, there needs to be an attitude of appreciation. This is thanking God for all that He has provided. His grace, which is unmerited favor. His mercy, not giving us what we rightly deserve. It's love and forgiveness. Joy is found in the little and the big things, and we're called to appreciate them all. Joy is also found in opportunities of celebrating. So next week, we want you to be present with us to celebrate. Wear a silly sweater. Bring a baked good. Eat a baked good. Share a cup of coffee. Share a cup of hot chocolate. And celebrate. Because celebration is a biblical way that we find the joy of Jesus. Amen? And for some of us, we struggle to celebrate. We're like, I can't celebrate, I can't have fun, I can't bust out of my little, like, way because I don't know what would happen. Well, joy would happen. Jesus would show up and it would be amazing. Celebration is a biblical way that we we interact with God and we enjoy the provisions that God has provided. And lastly, we exalt. The name of this praise is the Magnificat. It's Latin. And when translated, it means exalt. It means to lift high and make a big deal of God. And the bigger deal we make of God, the more joy we will find in our life. So church, are you struggling with joylessness? Because if you are, I would ask you, how are you doing with Jesus? If we're struggling with Jesus, we may be struggling with joy. But if we are solid with Jesus, we are probably solid with joy. We might not always be happy. We might not always be in a good disposition. We might not always have our anxiety levels low. Like I said, that dog brings me great anxiety. But I'm filled with the joy of the Lord. Amen? And there's nothing that could take my joy away because it is not something that comes from me. It is something that comes from God. So how do we find joy in the midst of the Christmas season? Well, we need to make sure we're in the right place. That we're praying, we're lamenting, we're appreciating, we're celebrating, and we're exalting the God who gives us joy in the first place. So I want to invite our band to come back up this morning, and as they do, I'm going to pray over us, and then we are going to sing our closing song. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this morning we know true and ultimate joy is found in Jesus. So for any of my brothers or sisters in this room this morning who are struggling with joy, would you send your Spirit? Your Word tells us that when your Spirit dwells within us as a rich deposit of the things that are to come, that your Spirit in our lives would bear good fruit. And the fruit of your Spirit, Lord, is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And that if we have your spirit, we have access to joy. And joy cannot be stolen by by unhappiness. And joy cannot be stolen by depression. And joy cannot be stolen by anxiety. Because joy is from Jesus. 
So Father, help us to experience joy this morning by helping us to root our hearts, our minds, our lives, our faith in Jesus. We love you. Remind us of the place we need to be. In Jesus' name, amen.